So the next talk is by Professor Sarit Kumar Das. So he is an, uh, an institute professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IIT Madras. He served as the director of IIT Rupar from Jan June 2015 to Jan 2021. He was honored with Professor K. N. Sidharamu Award and the Medal for Excellence in Research by the Indian Society for Heat and Mass Transfer in 2006. He, his research varies from a wide range of heat transfer applications like nanofluids, uh, biological heat transfer, microfluidics, and nanoparticle mediated drug delivery in cancer cells. He is the author of more than 250 peer reviewed journal articles and several books. He is an elected fellow of the National Academy of Science, India, and the Indian National Academy of Engineering. He also received the IIT Madras Lifetime Achievement Research Award in June 2021. Okay. So till that go on, let me uh, tell one thing, which is uh, uh, the work that I'll be presenting is uh, mostly done by one of my students uh, who is a faculty member in uh, SRM uh, University in Amaravati. And incidentally, his student is also here today. So that proves two things. One, we have been working in this problem for quite some time. And uh, I can tell you, it's uh, probably I'm seeing the signs in industry to go for commercialization of this. Although uh, at a certain point of time in history, nanofluids at schooling mediums were almost snubbed, said this has got no future. But we are seeing in reality that it's catching up. It proves the first, this particular point. And it also proves another thing. What is that? Very simple, I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, so if my student who worked on this, his student is, her student is present here, that obviously says that I'm getting old. So anyway. So, in fact, uh, I, I met another uh, participant here who comes from an institute where I served before this. I am here for 28 years. But before that, uh, I worked in this institute and at the same time, I submitted my PhD and I asked her what is the year of her birth. And that was the year I submitted my PhD. That, <laughs> that, that also says that I am getting old. But anyway, uh, this is uh, the thing I'm going to tell uh, about using nanofluids into microfluidic channel. Now, as you see, please, I don't want to learn more. <laughs> okay, so uh, electronic cooling, uh, the what is interesting in this is figure is the old experimental uh, you know, piece and we have kept one small coin to compare that one. So the entire thing that I am calling talking about is chips which are the normal chips but cooling channels are micro channels. Now this has a connectivity to the previous lecture in the sense that uh, Professor Arvind Patamata asked a question that can we not put the channels on the chip itself and cool it? And that was an idea not just now, probably about 15 years back uh, and even more maybe. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, till date, it has not been successful for various reasons. So I will come to that one. Okay. That's fine. This one, because I remember when first time addressing systems were introduced in IIT Madras, in the department a discussion was going on uh, how to do it, and I kept quiet. And I am never quiet. So the my colleague said, "Why are you so quiet?" I said, uh, "Because I don't need it." Mm -hmm. So my voice is. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues uh, made an anechoic chamber, you know, and he took me to show that. And after showing. Uh, he closed and showed, and then he came out and told everybody, my anechoic chamber is perfect because Dr. Das was inside, he spoke and nobody could hear outside. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't, uh, although I don't need it. 
So let's let's go to our our topic, which is. Where is the, yeah. So this is a, a thing. I think you have seen it a couple of hundreds of times. Moore's law every eighteen months they double and all that. Uh, that's not important. Do we have a pointer? Oh, okay. So the thing is that uh, let's let's uh, look here. The you know every 18 months it's doubling number of uh, number of uh, devices in a chip are doubling. That's not important. What is important is the second one, which is the devices are becoming smaller. What is happening to heat flux? You can say one one. Uh, Chip is giving only 5 watts, 10 watts, 20 watts. But 5 watts in how much of a cross section? When you are talking of nanometers, you know, millimeters by nanometers, millimeters by micrometers, the area is extremely small. So, what is happening as a result of that? If you see from 1970s to 2010, I have not talked about after that, you see the heat flux is going up. If you say watts per centimeter square, and what is important, this was the in, in even 1995, the time I was talking about, heat flux was that of a hot plate. But then it went up to the nuclear reactor point. And then in 2010, I'm talking for about 14 years back, heat flux was that of a rocket nozzle. And today it's even higher than that. So the challenge, what is the real challenge in electronic cooling is not so much about the amount of heat removed. It's the, the greatest problem is of the heat flux. And this is important for both the types of devices. One is using the chip. The other is making the chip. So if I go to the next one, see, Having the chip we have shown in the previous one, the chip itself dissipates that amount of heat, which is huge heat flux. But the other one is, when you want to make a chip, in fact, I'm doing a project for, for an industry in which, in typically what you have, you have got a silicon wafer. And it is done by iron and etching or plasma etching. And there the heat flux is huge. And you have to remove that one. It's, it's going inside the machine. This is the whole thing. So what happens, then here is plasma. Here is the wafer, silicon wafer, where you do the etching. And you have to cool it. So this entire heat has to be taken out. And this is a tremendous task, because the plasma has got heat fluxes of the highest that you can think of. So both in manufacturing of the electronic device and usage of the electric device, what is involved is high heat flux. So, as everybody knows, the conventional way is you have a microprocessor or your chip. On that, you have a heat spreader, and then you have got, you know, fins, and you have a fan, and you do it. Or nowadays, you know, you put a heat pipe and you remove it. But better would have been to, you know, you have channels inside which uh, Dr. Arvind pointed out. Can we have, say, if this is the you know, microprocessor, can we have channels inside and through that one, we cool it. Uh, there are different kind of technological challenges, including that of the uh, mechanical stability, uh, workability, cracking, uh, pressure drops, and uh, sustaining that kind of pressure of drop in a, a channel, arresting leaks. I had a student who did excellent work on micro channel, but she spent one year in arresting the leak of her uh, micro channel, her experimental setup. So it's not easy. It's, it's very, very difficult. So all these are the problems. Can you go back, please? Go back. Previous, previous slide. Yeah. So what <coughs> I'm trying to tell that 
instead of that, I am talking of liquid channel in the heat spreader itself to take out the heat. I am depending on liquid heat transfer because, of course, on one side, it has got better heat removal capability than air. But the other thing is, which is we can engineer it. See, one of the things that we have learned in heat transfer in the basics is this, that whatever is given as a cooling fluid to us is given by God. You call it God, you call it nature. The problem is once we select a fluid, you are stuck with all the properties. No. Suppose you select air, then you will get the conductivity of air, viscosity of air, specific heat of air, surface tension of air, boiling point of air, freezing point of air, everything is fixed. You can't change it. And this is the problem when you go to any of the fluids. The most important property for heat removal is probably thermal conductivity. And what is the range of thermal conductivity? Thermal conductivity of very bad solid is about 15, 20, say stainless steel, 15 to 25. Good ones, copper, 400. Aluminium, 300 watts per meter Kelvin. But when you think of the liquid, the best liquid available is water, still. And what is the thermal conductivity? 0.6 watts per meter Kelvin. Just 0.6. Com now you compare with the you know solids. So you have got a terrible bottleneck. It is something like you know I, I give this example very much. That's something like you know you want to go to Delhi, right? You are looking for a, an aircraft by doing you know better design, fins, turbulence, everything. You are looking for a flight which goes very fast. So instead of three and a half hours, I'm looking for an aircraft which will go in two and a half hours. But the problem is, to cross Gindi, I take two hours. <laughs> right? There is a, there is a, uh, uh, there is a rainy day and a traffic jam. So what is the point? That, yeah, and potholes and everything. Then what is the point of improving that aircraft thing if I cannot go in time and catch my flight. And this is exactly what is happening. In cooling technology, we think of fins, we think of turbulence, we think of it, everything. But we are stuck with the fluid. The fluid is the same old fluid, which has got its conductivity of 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.6 watts per meter Kelvin. Then what is the point? Because as we know, as heat transfer and fluid mechanics people, that there is a no slip boundary condition. Fluid sticks. And so the heat transfer, in fact, to the students who are sitting here, I will ask you a question and give me an answer. How many modes of heat transfer are there? Those who say three, <laughs> those who say three are wrong. Basic modes of heat transfer are only two, conduction and radiation. Convection is nothing but a conduction associated with a transport. Convection is not an independent, although convection dominated in the beginning. You know the story that um, our uh, Joseph Fourier, seven years after his PhD, he did not submit, you know, publish his paper that, you know, temperature, that, because he was very afraid, because the world was dominated by Newton. And Newton said, Newton said heat transfer is proportional to temperature difference. And he is saying it is on temperature gradient. He's in, a, in a way, he is contradicting Newton. So he was very much afraid. He didn't publish. And he went for war, you know, uh, as, a, as a general. And came back and after six or se seven or eight years, he published his paper. So what I'm trying to say, the whole problem here is that the conductivity of the fluid is the bottleneck. And here comes nanofluid. In nanofluid, what are we are trying to do? We are trying to put particles to fluids. So the next one. So we go to nanofluids, uh, you know, like this, these are the particles, different kinds of nanoparticles we put in. 
uh, fluids and you know we take the fluid mix it up do ultrasonication sometimes we use some stabilizing agent and create a suspension now and sometimes even the fluid we manufacture nowadays we are manufacturing a fluid which is called deep eutectic solvent we are taking two organic molecules one is this is diphenyl ether on dibenzyl ether and we are mixing them to a particular proportion we won't say the proportion it is being patented so and that we found out through uh, molecular dynamic simulation what should be the eutectic composition because at this composition we get the minimum freezing temperature so you know like electronic processing there the temperatures need to be minus 20 degree minus 30 degree fluid has to cool it and hence we found out kind of a combination which will give you that kind and then we want to put particles into it prepare what is called a nano fluid and use it for coolant now coming to that one when we have this nano fluid the whole idea is that I am trying to increase the thermal conductivity by putting some solid. Now we started doing it. I started working on nano fluid in 2000. Are we doing something great? No, because by putting particles, the conductivity of the liquid can be enhanced. Was something said by Maxwell 100 years back. But the problem was when you take micro particles, particles, even, they agglomerate. Okay, and then they wear out your pump, your line, your clog, your uh, fittings, everything. So, although theoretically it looks great, practically it's not usable. What was done? Two things were found out when first nanofluid was talked about. Firstly, we get larger enhancement, and the enhancement of thermal conductivity of the fluid depends on not just the particle fraction but also the size and why the size i'll come to that that means even if, if you use one person particle you can get greater and greater thermal conductivity enhancement if you go from say 100 nanometer to 50 nanometer 50 nanometer to 30 nanometer your enhancement increases and that was the revolution that you know so you can enhance based on particles so if you use very small fraction, all other problems are not there. It will not agglomerate, it will not sediment, it will not wear out. It. And because the particles are small, they don't have enough momentum to create you know, problems with your pump and other things. Even your pressure drop will not increase significantly. So this was the attraction of nanofluid. But then there was debate whether really it enhances that amount or not. There are many debates. But what we have seen definitely it enhances to a great extent next so what i will be showing now a realistic micro channel system now i want to use both the advantages i want to use micro channel and i want to use nano fluid why micro channel now you have to go i, I remember satish kandlikar in one of the uh, lectures in one international heat transfer conference he said, he was giving a lecture on microchannel. He said, if you have not read one paper, then you should not be in this room. And the paper is by Tuckerman and Pace. It's a paper which probably for the first time explored the potential of nano, uh, I mean, microchannels. And what is it? It's very simple. I mean, uh, to students, I ask this question uh, very often. For fully developed flow in a laminar flow, fully developed laminar flow in a channel, what is the relation between Lucelt number and Reynolds number? Tell me. It's constant. Of course. Lucelt number is independent of Reynolds number. It's constant. The constant, value of the constant depends on two things. One is thermal boundary condition. Constant heat flux, 4.36, and constant wall temperature, 3.66, right? But it also depends on shape. Now, the values that I said is only for circular. If you take square, it will be different and so on. 
Now, it essentially means if the Lussell number is constant, that means heat transfer coefficient is inversely proportional to the channel diameter. There comes the microchannel. You make the channel smaller and smaller, your heat transfer coefficient is larger and larger. But there is one problem, pressure drop is also larger and larger. So here comes the challenge of microchannel. What in this work we are trying to do, we are trying to combine the microchannel advantage along with the nanofluid. So this is our experimental setup in which we used a you know, parallel microchannel uh, heat sink. So you go to that one. Go to the next one. So these are our, how we fabricated. This, these were, you know, today's manufacturing techniques can make microchannels of hundreds of microns. I'm not talking of tens of microns, but I'm talking only hundreds of microns, very easy. By microfabrication technique, you can do it. Next. Nowadays, we are making with additive manufacturing also. And so this is our setup. This is our, the one that we said and, you know, all other things. But this is what is interesting. The micro channel, usually we do all experiments by a heater. But we had an array of heaters like this. In the same, you know, area, as a microchip, we didn't use a single heater. We used nine heaters. The reason is we want to see what is the effect of hot spots. Most of the work in electronic cooling done with heaters, they take one heater and they put a wattage equal to the chip. The problem is in the chip, the heat is never uniform. The temperatures are non-uniform. That's why we use nine heaters to heat whichever one we want to whichever extent we want. So we use this one, and these are the controls of each section, each subheaters uh, done independently. Next one. First, we simulated the whole thing. And in simulation, what is important, everything is, you know, everyone, CFD people know. This is the standard one, but there are two things which is, you know, uh, we did two simulation methods. One is called effective property model. One is called discrete phase model. Effective property model is, I consider, I don't consider that particles are there. I consider it's one fluid. And so I take effective property, uh, average property. I will show the equations for effective property and I use it. The other one is I really take property, you know, the particles. So I track the particles. So the particle is in Lagrangian frame and the fluid is in, the base fluid is in Eulerian frame. So I do it like that. That is called DPM, discrete phase model. So in this case, this interaction forces between the particle and fluid will come. So these are the interaction forces. And in case of uh, effective property model, these are zero. Now if you look at this, this is the particle equation. Velocity of the particle and then, you know, the forces which are acting on particle. And what are those forces? Next one. The forces are like this, drag force, Brownian force, thermophoresis, sap and lift force. All these forces we are adding up so that that force is equal to all these forces. Next one. Pressure gradient force virtual mass force. So, we use exactly those forces and then simulate. If we use effective property model, these are the effective properties. <coughs> these are simply, you know, you know, weighted, uh, weighted uh, average of this. And this is uh, some modification of weighted average. For nanofluids, there are many models. One is called, you know, uh, Hamilton Crosser model. One is, a classical model is Maxwell's model from their hamilton crosser model where they take the uh, effect of shape, etc. Et Next one. So after this, how I combine, we combine these things. See, there are three types of, in micro channel, if I have parallel channels, there are three types of arrangements which are possible. And the arrangements are like this, U, Z, and I. U means you go like this, it makes a new. 
Z means you go like this, go back there. I means you come here, spread, go, and then combine and go. So three types of things. So we had experimental data. We did this flow data with pressure drops and numerical and experimental we combined. We were very good. So our computation works, at least for a fluid, for a single fluid. Next. So these are the kinds of microchannels and these are the ranges of Reynolds number we have used, you can see. Our uncertainties are very low and hence I could say it's a solid platform for doing the experiments. Next. So this is, you know, the flow maldistribution. Now this is where is the problem, you know, all, uh, you know, I, I came to this domain, I started my career as a person in heat exchange. And in heat exchanger, specifically I worked on plate heat exchangers. And the plate heat exchanger is exactly the same thing. The fluid is coming and they are going to parallel channels. So I used that concept here. So these are parallel channels. I knew in heat exchanger that flow mild distribution is a severe thing. In fact, one of the things I did was a consultancy for our defense forces uh, from a couple of kilometers from here is our, uh, you know, factory, defense factory which makes the tanks, war tanks. And they came with a problem that their heat exchanger, the, you know, tank is a terrible thing. Tank, uh, uh, we say in car, how many liters, how many kilometers per liter the car moves, right? In tank, they said how many liters per kilometer. Our Arjun tank takes eight liters of diesel to go one kilometer, right? Eight liters. The weight of the tank is 54 tons. So you can understand. And the radiator has to have a capacity of 1.2 megawatt. The heat that you have to dissipate is 1.2 megawatt. Now, in these kinds of a situation, it's terrible because, see, the whole of the tank, if you see, if you really go and sit inside a tank, you will feel for the driver. The driver has got no space sits like this, here is wall, here is wall, and he has to drive, and if it shakes, which it shakes always, he will hit his head against the wall. <coughs> so this is what it is. Because Why? Because the space which is required for the storage of the fuel. You have to store 1500 liters of diesel. So there is no space, even for the radiator. So I did analysis, I said, can you give me some increase of 100 millimeter? They said, no, we can give you 30 millimeter. So, increase of, of the, uh, the, you know, manifold. So, from there, I have understood that the maldistribution, we found out that the problem of the, of the tank was the malfunctioning of the fluid flow. See, when we send a fluid and we have parallel channel, the first assumption we make is that the fluid is going, getting equally divided into the, channel and that's the worst assumption. Fluid never goes equal and that is what it shows. You see for a U type this is the profile, pressure profile, for Z type this is the profile and for I type this is the profile. So as a, as a result of that flow mile distributions will be there and we did experiments, numerical versus experiment and we found yes we are predicting well there is severe flow mile distribution. So how to take care of that? Next. So flow mile distribution, we characterized by a number which is minimum pressure drop by maximum pressure drop within the microchannel and one minus that will give you the extent of mile distribution. Next one. So we did the same thing. Now we did experiment and we had these two computational models. Now what we found that DPM models, the discrete phase model is required. If you particularly, if you have got more particle loading and if you have got higher flow rates, then the DPM model is a must because DPM model can tell you the values, effective values that we are taking. Actually, the particles are not going to be uniformly distributed. Why DPM model is required is for two reasons. One is certain forces you are neglecting. 
why nanofluid works better than others are those forces. Things like thermophoresis and Brownian motion are important, which is neglected when you take you know, effective property model. That is one reason. But there is one reason, one more reason, that because of those forces, the particles are not equally distributed. So there are some places where there are more particles, there are some places where there are less particles. And this is, you know, thermophoresis driven diffusion of particles. And because of that, the effective conductivity of one place is more than other. Effective, con you know, viscosity of one place is more than other. And if you don't take them into consideration, your computation cannot be correct. And that's what uh, these things show, that the effective, uh, you know, um, conductivity model or effective property model doesn't do a good job. It's the di discrete phase model which gives you accurate predictions. Next. Yeah, these are also, you know, we have uh, done with different particles loading. Aluminium oxide, copper oxide, silicon oxide, CNT, and graphene. And we found that better nanofluids are with the carbon particles, that is, CNT and graphene are better. Now, why graphene is better? We had earlier work in, in, in which we analyzed the models for graphene nanofluids, etc. So we could explain that one. Next. Now here, this is computation. You look at that. In the computation, these colors are for particle concentration. Now you can very clearly see the particles are not uniformly distributed. Particles are random, not random, but patches are there. And so Brownian is found to play dominant role. And also, we will see in the next one, Go to the next one. You can see that thermophoresis induces additional directional drift and it brings out further changes. See, otherwise, at zero concentration, you should not have uh, you know, any discrepancy. But even at zero, you have got it, which clearly shows that the thermophoresis is a force to reconcile. So we have tried with, you know, zero, that means no uh, no thermal gradient, then you have 100 watts per meter, meter square and 2000, uh, 1000 watts per meter square and 2000. So for high heat flux, drift of particles towards colder channel, the top region is evident in 5 to 7 channels and which shows that this is due to local heat spot. So next one. Okay, so just like flow mal distribution, which is characterized by ratio of pressure, this particle mal distribution is also characterized by concentrations. So this is what is the concentration mal distribution, and you could see that what is interesting that the flow mal distribution and particle mal distribution may be in the two different directions. For example, you look here. The flow mal, you know, flow mal distribution from 1% to 5% is coming down. The flow mal distribution is going up, but the particle mal, mal distribution is coming down. So, the two mal distributions need not work in the same direction. They are completely independent. Next. Now, we are coming to using this we are coming to simulations that we have done in a microchannel system with particles and without particles. Now, this is without particles, a U-type microchannel system. This hotspot here. If you cool it, still there will be hotspot at that point because of the flow mal distributions. Now, the same one, if I use nanoparticles, then the hotspot reduces. And if I use the DPM model, it further reduces. Which means, now this is where I talk of a smart fluid. Who is a smart guy? Right. You know, a smart guy is, uh, you have seen, uh, see these, uh, uh, the two players, Lionel Messi and, uh, yeah, and Cristiano Ronaldo. Now, they are completely different style players. 
But you will see one thing which is very common in them, which is they will never, you know, waste their energy where there is no need. They will keep on, you know, working like this, these, 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 and suddenly at the top of the penalty box, they become active. Because this is where, as a striker, his requirement is there. So, this is smart football. And this is smart fluid. Nano fluid. Because it is more active where the temperature is more. Nano fluids are found to be more active where the temperature is more. It is less active where the temperature is less. That means, now, this is one work which I did accidentally about 20 years back, uh, about 25 years back. Probably that is uh, in my, of course, in my career, the highest cited paper. We published a paper in ASME Journal of Heat Transfer in, in the year 2001 or two uh, on how with small increase in temperature from 20 degrees to 50 degrees, the enhancement of conductivity goes from 10% to 30%. So that is what by experiments we show. That paper is today you know, cited 3,500 times. And probably that was the point I realized the potential of nanofluid. Now that means wherever temperature is more, nanofluid's conductivity will be more. Actually, if you just think of that enhancement of, uh, you know, conductivity of either the fluid or the particle with temperature from 20 degree to 50 degree, it's nothing. It's not even 1%. But combined way, their enhancement is three times. Why? The reason being those forces, Brownian forces, thermophoresis forces, with temperature, these forces come into play. Because as we know, Brownian force, you see, the Br Brownian force, the, uh, the famous Einstein's formula, the Br Brownian velocity, is directly proportional to temperature. But more importantly, it is inversely proportional to viscosity of the liquid. Now, viscosity is a very strong function of temperature. So if you increase the temperature, numerator increases and denominator decreases. So because of both, you get enhancement, right? And like this, even thermophoresis and other things. And that's why, see, these are, this is, if I don't consider that thermophoresis, etc., etc., in effective property model, this is the kind of temperature picture. But in reality, you will get this, because the fluid acts as a smart fluid. Wherever it is hot, it becomes more active. Now, this is what we have seen. This is the Z type, same story. With, with water alone, it is. With nanofluid, this one. Effective property model says, but what comes closer to our experiment is this one. It's a smart one. Next one. This is the I one, in which, you know, we, we see a similar thing. So, EPM cannot predict such effects. Since it is effective property and everywhere I have taken the property to be same. Okay, fine. So, next one. So, next one is, we have seen the same things with you know, different type of micro channel, different heat fluxes, etc., etc., and everywhere the conclusion is same. Let's go to the next one. And the next one. So we can see that, you know, we, we say this is a figure of merit. Figure of merit means this describes the, just like unevenness of uh, flow. This is the unevenness of temperature we characterize by this, and our computation and experiments, you could see, are nearby. And what we can see from this one, that the Z type is the best one, and the I type is in the middle, and the U type is the worst one, in terms of equality of temperature. So the most non-uniform temperature you will get with the U type, and anywhere the nanofluid is better. In each type, the nanofluid is giving more uniformity of temperature due to smart behavior. But so, we discard U type and use everywhere only Z type heat sink? No. Now, this is where comes the role of localized heat flux, the hot spots. Let's go to the next one. So, we take this. That we, 
the till now whatever results I have shown experimentally or theoretically is uniform heat flux. We have given one heater, one heat flux. Now if I don't give that, if I give like this and I give different heat fluxes at different points, so what do we get? And this we have not given arbitrary. We have taken from real life data of chips what kind of hotspots we get. And next one. So we have hots like this, we have hotspots at different points and we have simulated that. And we have found out that, you know, the story is different. This is U type, next. This is I type, you can see the hotspots are. So it all depends on where you have given hotspot and what kind of flow arrangement you give. Next one, and this is Z type. So in this, we said hotspots have got a, you know, 10 watts of heat dissipation, whereas the other places have got only 2.5 watts. Next. Now, this is where you, you can see the thermal performance of this one employing only water. Again, you can see that we are able to replicate our experiment and uh, simulations are quite close and all the simulations here are by DPM model, discrete phase model. Next one. The same one with nanofluids. Even here, we are close, you know, within two, three degrees we are here. Next one, which is most important. No, next one. These are for different fluids. Now, this is the final conclusion I am coming to. We have got heat fluxes at different points. And for different points, if I use different flow configurations, now from this matrix, it shows that for some cases, depending on the location of the hotspot, right, even U type is the best one. Okay. And for some cases, this is this one, some cases both are good. So it shows very clearly that we cannot flatly say that U type is better, Z type is better. It depends on the pattern of heat generation of your chip. So looking at your chip, looking at the location of your hotspot, the value of the hotspots, we can choose the microchannel flow configuration. This is the first one. And the second one is, of course, for all configuration, nanofluid is always better than pure. Thanks. I'm coming to so this is the same one, figure of merit we have plotted. Again, the same uh, conclusion. It depends on what chip, where is the maximum temperature, etc., to decide on both. But of course, nanofluid, uh, as I said, it depends on what is the stability of the nanofluid and how much percentage of temperature, I mean, uh, thermal conductivity improvement it takes. So the last one, these are my conclusions. So a near active cooling of microprocessor in the heat spreader is presented in which the flow configuration and fluid maldistribution has been considered. And we have seen that the Z is generally the best configuration uh, followed by I and U. Non-homogeneous nanofluids, uh, we have observed that the particle migration effects like uh, Brownian motion, thermophoresis, drag, gradient pressure are very important. DPM model is the model which we should use. Uh, we have to consider the particles uh, if the concentrations are considerable. And the particular behavior of concentration distribution pattern uh, depends on predominantly Brownian diffusion. Flow mile distribution generated hotspot have been explored. And the realistic system has been studied in which we found that in some cases, the U, some cases Z, and some cases I are the best configuration. Nanofluids are conclusively, uh, you know, found to be effective for cooling of electronic devices. Uh, last one is, of course, this. But with this, I will make one comment that all these are theoretical and possibilities. But today, which I cannot present right now because of intellectual properties, I am working with uh, two, three companies from uh, battery cooling to electronic processing. 
everywhere, people are interested in using nanofluids. And particularly using nanofluids with different base fluids, not water, not the standard ones, but the nanofluids that we are proposing. We can have, you know, eutectic fluids, which have got, we have got a fluid which has got minus 40 degree, you know, um, freezing temperature and plus 200 degree boiling temperature. So the kind of range it gives is amazing. So all these, with this base fluid, and the greatest thing is, in electronic cooling, you have to keep it in mind. The fluid must have good conductivity, viscosity, etc., etc., and of course, greater range, cooling and freezing point. But along with that, it must have a very good dielectric property. It should not break down under thermal cycling or thermal heat flux. So these are the things that we can do it. So essentially, by nanofluid, we are engineering new fluids by which use of you know technologies like like the microchannel technology will give us the ultimate edge. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Professor Das, uh, because we are running out of time because the next talk is online. Professor Karayanis has already joined us. And uh, we may take just a short 10 minute, 10 minute tea break. Uh, so I would like uh, any questions are there, you can please discuss with Professor Das personally. He will also be having tea. We'll have the so questions. One, one question I will address. Yeah, so one question. Yeah, two. He has, he three has hands two. and then all three of you. No, no, you will be common. So thank you for a uh, wonderful uh, presentation, sir. Uh, my question is uh, at what concentration is best? You know, uh, uh, means the channel is okay, but at no, what I concentration? Okay. The concentration depends on the other thing. See, giving free hand, I will use the highest possible concentration. But highest concentration also brings agglomeration, sedimentation, and all other things. So nanofluids typically are used at a concentration of less than 1%. Okay. So we are talking of 0.5 to 1% uh, by weight concentration. That's it. We are not talking beyond that. Because then it doesn't remain nanofluid. It becomes a covalent. And, and the things are different. Of course, I, I told the inventor of nanofluid was uh, Stephen Choi in, uh, um, in, in Argonne National Laboratory. And I told him that uh, this is essentially colloid. Why do you call it nanofluid? He said, who will give me money for colloid? I will get money for nanofluids. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir.